All right, let's see. So this is prompted by a question I got on the hide, on sniper side, uh, regarding the introduction of the new EOTAC Voodoo 5 to 25 by 50 shorty scope. The scope is uh, supposedly performs really well. We'll see. I'll see it at shop next week. And it is, a, I think, 11.2 inches in length, something like that. And the question came up is that, well, what are the compromises, right? I mean, there are not that many ultra short scopes. Schmidt almost had it to themselves for a bit there with some other attempts here and there. What are the compromises? What is good? What is bad? What is difficult? Why doesn't everybody do this, right? Well, first of all, I think we'll see it more and more because it's um, it complicates the design a bit. But the it's not even so much its design also, but it's not so much the design as being able to build it to spec that's kind of difficult. And uh, uh, the capability is ever increasing and the market pressure I think is going to drive a lot of makers into producing scopes that are sort of on the short side. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that keeping it short and maintaining very high magnification ratio is difficult. So I'm not going to make this too long. Uh, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One, so what is a typical internal design for a rifle scope, for an old scope, like an old 6 axis, or something fairly simple. So if this is, I'm not an artist, so my apologies. Right, so if this is the objective bell, you've got your turret, and you've got your eyepiece, right? So that's, that's a very ugly scope. All right, in here, inside the tube, you have three separate optical systems, right? So there is the Objective system goes from here to about here, right? And I talk about it in my various writings. Um, I'm putting together an update to my rifle scope fundamentals. I'm probably going to talk about it there, right? Then there is the erector assembly. Uh, despite the mildly pornographic name, the word erector has nothing to do with that. And then there is the eyepiece. So the three optical systems are distinctly different. Uh, they all have their own performance that affects the overall performance of a rifle scope. And they all have to be matched to each other really well. Like when you have tunneling, it's one of the issues with matching and all that. So what are the optical elements inside? In the objective, in the simplest form, you have a couple of lenses here, you know, like a doublet, for example, or something like that. That takes the light that comes in and focuses is basically somewhere here. This is where the first focal plane reticle is, right? Then the erector system basically takes an image here, magnifies it, massages it, inverts it, uh, because here it's flipped and all that sort of stuff. And that's, uh, it can be in simple uh, erector systems, it's typically you know, four lenses maybe, like, uh, like this, and let's say like this. Right, so that goes through here, comes out here. This is your second focal plane, right? And the eyepiece will have a few more lenses that basically take an image from here and project it out uh, to your eye, right? And this is gonna look like I'm not, I'm not really an optical designer, right? I'm an imaging guy, so something like. this, like this, like this. Let's say three lenses, maybe four, something like that, whatever. Okay. So this would not, this number or number of lens elements would not be out of place in a scope like a 6x Leopold or even 3 to 9 uh, Leopold or something like that. And if you count optical elements, you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's not too bad. That's, I think, some of the early various full fields like 6x were like this. And you will have one flat element if you have a glass edge radical. It would be in either in the front focal plane or in the second focal plane, right? Depending on what kind of scope this is. Uh, if you have adjustable uh, focus, like AO, adjustable objective, 
Then it'd be a ring here that moves this whole thing in and out of just one of the elements, right? And changes the position uh, of the focal plane to adjust for distance, right? If you have side focus, you will have, um, I don't have any other colors. You might have one more lens here, uh, like uh, something like this. This moving in and out, when you turn your side focus on this, there's one more lens or lens group that moves in and out here that adjusts. Make sure that you're focused on the front focal plane when the reticle is in an FFD scope. Right? So this is not terribly complicated. Uh, people have been doing this for a long time. This can be done reliably. So I scout around. There are not too many diagrams out there with actual actual rifle scopes, but there is one I have. I took a copy, uh, took a picture of a page in a hand-sold manual. It was a manual for the 4 to 16 by 56 scope, which is still one of the nice uh, deforming scopes in terms of optics, although it's been around for a while. And uh, it shows in good approximation, I think, uh, the optical elements in the 4 to 16 by 56 hand sold. And for its time, this is one of the shorter designs in terms of overall, overall length. So I thought I'd put it up here. And I hope you can see it reasonably well. It's a smaller picture. So here, the way I drew it, you've got either two or three or four lenses in objective lens system. And some of the ones you'll have a triplet here to make it APO. And some others, uh, a few more. Let's look at the objective system of the hand sold that was Need to be made shorter. So there are one, two, three, four elements here. Another two here were six. Another two here. This is a field flat and also what moves in and out for uh, side focus. So I've got a total of four, six, eight optical elements. Uh, just an objective lens system. Before we get to the uh, to the reticle and the front focal plane, right? Remember this, uh, if you don't have side focus, this whole thing is nine elements, right? And if you look here, for example, this secondary lens group is there for one reason and one reason only, to make it shorter, right? And probably something here. The basic problem with optical design is that bending light introduces aberrations. There are color aberrations, there are also geometric aberrations, like a distortion and all that sort of stuff. Uh, color aberrations is uh, chromatic aberration, right? The basic problem is that if I make a long objective system, if light's coming in like this, I didn't bend it by that much of an angle here. I think that's the simplest way I can describe it. So it's not too difficult. You don't pick up too many aberrations, right? If I want to shorten this thing, and I put in, uh, move the, uh, put in these lenses here, and try to focus on the same focal plane that's comparatively close to the lenses, I'm going to have a lot more in terms of uh, uh, different aberrations, all right? And they have to be corrected, right? So I'm going to start making this whole thing more complicated. The shorter you make this, the more complicated it becomes. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind also is that uh, in the hand salt, it's a four-time uh, erector ratio. So there's only five lenses in the erector systems in the modern scopes with eight power or whatever. You have usually an extra lens group here and some other correcting lenses, because to have that much magnification and have it corrected, you need more optical elements. And the way it works, you have one optical element, you put it in, you know what aberrations it introduces, so you put in a second one to correct some of those. It's not going to correct all of them. You put in the next one to correct those and do some other things, right? So every, every time you get a little further down in this whole chain of optical elements, you have to be mindful of how you massage the image around it, whatever else, but also you have to be mindful of correcting the aberrations, color aberrations, geometric aberrations, uh, uh, whatever else you need to do. If you do not, well, before I get right, so we've got an exponential increase in the number of optical elements, right? In this typical scope, I counted, before I butchered it with my crap, I counted uh, nine elements, thereabouts, right? In the hand sold, I've got eight in objective lens system. I've got reticle, let's say nine, uh, five in the erector, 14, and four in the eyepiece, right? And in a, uh, so I've got uh, a total of 18 optical elements. March scopes have even more. Is my microphone still on? Yes, the microphone's still on. Hopefully you can hear me. 
The March scopes have even more with high rep ratio, short overall length. They have really complicated designs, a bunch of elements stepped up. In the days before high quality anti-reflective coatings, you couldn't do this shit because you were losing so much light at every interface, you really couldn't get this complicated, not easily, right? With modern air anti-reflective coatings, this is okay. If you add adding a few more elements, really does not do a whole lot for light transmission. What it does do is it, aside from the design being complicated, now manufacturing becomes complicated because every single element has to be centered, has to be aligned, has to be mounted, has to be mounted in such a way that recoil is not going to uh, knock it loose, right? And that kind of gets complicated. And the shorter this whole thing is, the more you bend light, if you speak, the tighter are the tolerances for all of the elements. Right? This is something that doesn't get addressed a whole lot. Modern manufacturing techniques have helped with that a little bit. Well, more than a little bit, a lot. Also, in the past, you were limited in what kind of surface shapes you could have for each individual element. Now, when you can do comparatively inexpensive high quality A spheres, you can actually cut down a bit on the number of elements, right? In the old days, doing a design like this would take you know, a lot of elements. Now you can cut it down by a few by using ED glass and A spheres and all sorts of other stuff. But still, every time you introduce optical elements, you add design complexity. And if you don't design it quite right, for example, if they just made this a little more complicated for short focal length without adding this and make it a retrofocal design, uh, you would also start having a penalty in terms of depth of field and depth of focus. Depth of field is how much depth of field you see and what you see. Uh, depth of focus is how much tolerance you have for the reticle, for the image position with respect to the reticle, right? That in return makes sight focus a little bit touchier, a little bit trickier. It's one of the reasons, for example, March scopes have, first of all, they have a mic still on, yes. Uh, they have a touchy parallax a little bit, and they have very shallow depth of field. That is the 3 to 24s. The, uh, the larger marches don't, right? The why do compact marches, march scopes do this? Because they're trying to be very short and they're trying to be quite light, right? So all the focal lengths are short. The elements are small, the reticle is small. It all kind of adds up, right? For example, when you're talking about an eight power uh, eraptor, one of the things that is not talked about too much is that the physical size of the image between the front focal plate and rear focal plate, the ratio can be significantly eight times, right? So to fit inside the tube, the image here has to be very, very small in the front focal plane. Or if this the image in the second focal plane is gonna be very, very large and you may have to make get a larger tube going for it. That may be one of the reasons why Zeiss V8 scopes actually went with a 36 millimeter tube, right? I think they need the real estate because of the high erector ratio and to fit all this stuff, right? The, you, in an eight power erector scope, you will have more than two lens groups moving with respect to each other. So you need even more space for this and for the mechanics that move and control the tubes and keep them in place under recoil and all that sort of stuff. Uh, all of this propagates down by the time you get there. If you don't correct for all of this really, really well, your eye relief position, what is commonly called by the term eye box, the term I hate with a passion. An eye box to me is a box full of glass eyes. Right? But eye relief can become critical. Cancel historic, but has amazing eye relief. But this is a complicated design. What they do, and everything is matched so well, everything is done so nicely. Uh, there is certain Optical design from a standpoint of pure science is not that, you know, there's nothing revolutionary there. From a standpoint of engineering, there is an art to this, to a certain degree, and you see it more in photographic lenses. From an optic standpoint, the rifloscopes are not that complicated, but they become complicated because of the mechanical restraints. We're trying to make things small, we're trying to make things light, we're trying to make things compact, we're trying to make all this shit stay together under recoil, and that's not that straightforward and uh, yeah and lastly one of the things to keep in mind I'll give you an example with SIG scopes uh, SIG made a 3 to 18 by 44 Tango 6 the Gen 1 scope was pretty long I tested it was a really nice scope 
it weighed uh, 32 ounces, something like that. For the Gen 2, they went with a much shorter design. I think that's a 318 by 44 that is 12 inches long. I think it's 12 or 12.1, something like that. But it got shorter, yes, but it got heavier. Now it's, I think, 38 ounces, right? Every time people talk about scope weight, they go, oh, larger tube makes it heavy. The tube itself is really, really light. The weight difference, you can calculate easily the weight difference between a 30 and a 34 millimeter tube. The aluminum density is well known. It is really nothing. All this extra weight is coming in from having to put in a bunch of extra glass elements and from having to mount them, right? All of this stuff has to survive under recoil. For example, if you have a high vector ratio uh, scope, you've got a bunch of optical elements that are not fixed to the scope tube. They're fixed to the internal mechanical assembly that has to be beefy enough and strong enough to hold all this stuff together, move it around when you adjust your turrets and not move it around when you've got recoil, right? The amazing thing about March is that they made this high erector ratio scopes that are light, which is really impressive. But the downside was the shallow depth of field and touchy parallax, because what did March do? They didn't go with a heavy retrofocal design like this. They just made a much more complicated objective group, short focal length, lots of corrections here. All the elements are small and extremely precise. You're paying for it to a certain degree with uh, shallow depth of field, touching parallax, comparatively tight uh, eye relief, right? Is it a worthy compromise for a lot of people? Yeah, and I like March scopes, right? I like the 3 to 24 by 42. Um, there's still nothing quite exactly like it out there because of what it weighs, right? If you want it to be a little bit more user-friendly in terms of use, it will be heavier with more technology, right? As we get more A-spheres and strange refractive index elements and all that, strange dispersion elements, you will get some other, you will get some other variations. Right, but with what we've got right now, the for example, the EOTech Voodoo 5 to 25 by 50, um, in all the brief specs that I've seen, maybe it's out, maybe I missed it, I don't see the weight listed anyway. I think there is a reason for it. The thing is probably going to be heavy. EOTech is uh, the, the shorty Voodoo is likely to be a light optics works design, right? And all of the LOW designs I've seen to date that make comparatively short scopes for whoever is the actual company, every time LOW makes a short scope as an OEM, it is not light. Um, I'm sure they'll solve it as we go along, but um, all of them are comparatively heavy. Okay. Anyhow, I think I covered it reasonably well. I hope you can um, see the image nicely enough. And uh, that's it. I think I am done. I'll upload this to YouTube. I'll put it in a post on my blog. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for watching.